in the last one, if I remember correctly, we left off on page 57. So that was um, the first half of chapter 5. So this is the second half of chapter 5. And we were on the subheading, Third scene, women weeping over the god Tammuz, paragraph 13. So we were kind of going through Ezekiel chapter 8, basically. This one is called Women Weeping Over the God Tammuz. So this is paragraph 13. It says, read Ezekiel 8, 13, and 14. It says, and he said to me, turn again, and you will see greater abominations that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. So that's the paragraph they were, I'm sorry, those are the verses they wanted us to read for paragraph 13. It says, following, this is paragraph 13 now, the beginning. Following the first two scenes of detestable practices, Jehovah again told Ezekiel, you will see detestable things that are even more terrible than they're do, uh, that they're doing. What then did the prophet see next? At the entrance of the north gate of the house of Jehovah, he saw women sitting and weeping over the god Tammuz. A deity of Mesopotamia, Tammuz is called Demuzi in Sumerian texts and is thought to have been the consort of the fertility uh, I'm sorry, the consort of the fertility goddess Ishtar. The Israelite women were evidently weeping as some part uh, as part of some religious ritual connected with the death of Tammuz. By weeping over Tammuz in Jehovah's temple, those women were carrying out a pagan ritual in a center for pure worship. But a false religious observance was not sanctified by being carried out in God's temple. Why, from Jehovah's standpoint, those apostate women were doing detestable things! Exclamation mark. A lot of information here. Um, and as I said, generally I just... I distrust anything that I find in these, uh, like in this literature. It wouldn't come as a surprise to me to find that everything that they said in here was true, but I always look it up just to be 100% sure. Um, it, it, you know, when it's coming from something like this that, that is just outright propaganda, that's just biased to the core and setting doctrine for this religion. It's better to just not trust it um, inherently. Just look it up. You know, it's worth it to just look it up in my eyes. So some of the claims they made in this paragraph were, okay, it says Tammuz was a deity of Mesopotamia. It's called uh, Dumuzi in Sumerian texts. So let me just Google that real quick. Dumuzi. Mm, interesting. So the first result is Dumuzid. D-U-M-U-Z-I-D. Jehovah's Witnesses book left the, the last D off. So it was just D-U-M-U-Z-I in their book. But it says Dumuzid, later known by the alternate form Tammuz, is an ancient Mesopotamian god associated with shepherds, who's also the primary consort of the goddess Inanna, later known as Ishtar. Interesting. So FYI, I'm actually looking at Wikipedia right now, and before everybody freaks out about that, bear with me here, I know Wikipedia is a terrible, awful source. It should never be used as a source, period. I never use this as a source, and let me tell you why real quick. The reason I don't use Wikipedia as a source is because I was doing research for... Some of you may have heard this before. I was doing research for uh, the Twelve Tribes cult, and I discovered inadvertently that the Wikipedia page was written by a current Twelve Tribes member. It, there was just bias all through it. It wasn't even veiled. It wasn't even hidden. It was insane. And they were just lying outright. They were ignoring evidence and all kinds of crazy stuff. So after that, I mean, sometimes I'd use Wikipedia as kind of a jumping off point. Um, after that, I really don't use it at all. Uh, it, not as a research source. In this case, I was just seeing if it had anything different to say about, uh, about this 
than the Jehovah's Witness literature did. But ultimately, Wikipedia is really, really, really not good to use uh, pretty much for anything solid. Okay, let's continue on. So that was paragraph, uh, that was paragraph 13. So here's 14. What lesson can we learn from Jehovah's view of what those women were doing? To keep our worship pure, we must never mix it with unclean pagan practices. Hence, we must have nothing to do with observances that have pagan religious origins. Does origin really matter? Yes. Today, the practices associated with uh, certain observances, such as Christmas and Easter, may seem harmless. But let us not forget that Jehovah saw firsthand the pagan religious practices that eventually became, or that eventually have become, modern-day observances. In Jehovah's view, pagan practices do not become less detestable with the passage of time, or through efforts to mix them with pure worship. Oh man, this is an interesting paragraph. A few things to note about this, real quick. Notice what they say here. In Jehovah's view, pagan practices do not become less detestable, blah, blah, blah. They're telling us what Jehovah thinks about this thing or that thing. How Jehovah feels about whatever. Uh, how they would know that, I don't know, especially considering he's a, an imaginary friend, you know, for all intents and purposes. But they fancy themselves prophets. They believe that they sit in a position uh, that would enable them to tell us what Jehovah thinks. Uh, they think that Jehovah has anointed them as his mouthpiece on earth, and that's why they say things like that. They are communicating what God wants to us because we can't communicate with him directly like that. Something to make note of is the fact that wedding rings are also from what one might call a pagan origin. So wedding rings, I don't really remember the origins of wedding rings now, but it came from a, it, it has pagan roots, just the same as Christmas or Easter or any other thing. So why do Jehovah's Witnesses wear wedding rings? Why do they wear wedding rings, but they don't celebrate Christmas or Easter or any of that other stuff? Look, I understand why they'd want to avoid something like Halloween that's just blatantly, I don't know, demonic, quote-unquote, if you want to look at it that way. But Christmas is just fun. It's this commercial holiday. It's this fun thing. Wedding rings are just a symbol of your love. Really nothing more at this point, you know? Why are they okay with wearing wedding rings, but not okay with celebrating Christmas? There's a level of hypocrisy involved here. So that was the end of 14. This is the beginning of the next subheading. It says, fourth scene, 25 men bowing down to the sun. So it says, read Ezekiel 8, 15 through 18. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty-five men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they were worshipping the sun toward the east. And he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and they've returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore I always I'm sorry, therefore I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Alright, so that was Ezekiel 8, 15 through 18. This is the beginning of paragraph 15. It says, Jehovah introduced the fourth and final scene with the now familiar words. You will see the detestable things that are even more terrible than these. Perhaps the prophet wondered, what could be more terrible than the things I've already seen? Ezekiel was now in the inner courtyard of the temple. There, at the entrance of the temple, he saw 25 men bowing down to worship the sun in the east. Those men could hardly have found a way to, uh, to offend Jehovah more deeply. How so? Okay. So, uh, according to Jehovah's Witnesses here, they're saying that Jehovah was deeply offended by 
these 25 men bowing down to worship the sun to the east. I guess paragraph 16 is going to tell us exactly why he was offended. God, this dude is triggered so easily. It's like a snowflake over here. Okay, this is paragraph 16. Picture the scene. God's temple was built with the entrance facing east. Worshippers entering the temple would be facing west, but their backs to the rising sun in the east. But the 25 men in the vision turned their backs to the temple and faced east so that they could worship the sun. In so doing, they turned their backs on Jehovah, for the temple was the house of Jehovah. Okay. Oh, fascinating. Those 25 men were apostates. They ignored Jehovah, and they violated the command recorded at Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 19. How they offended the God who rightly deserves exclusive devotion. Oh, man. There's a lot in this paragraph that's, that's really interesting. Okay. So they're saying that in the very beginning, God's temple was built with the entrance facing east. Worshippers entering the temple would be facing west. So these guys turned and faced to the east to do the, the worshiping for one reason or another. But the temple was to the west, so they, they physically were, they turned around and were facing in a direction that was opposite the temple to do this thing they were doing, and that offended God. It was just the fact that they had turned in a specific direction to, to execute this procedure. That's what offended him. That's what hurt him. I, I don't know. That feels a little bit over the top to me. Seriously? The dude gets upset if you turn your body in a specific direction to, to perform some task? Give me a break. Now, I understand what they were doing was worshiping another god, and God is pretty persnickety about that in the Bible. You're not supposed to, I mean, he's jealous. He's a jealous God. He'll kill anybody who worships somebody else, even though, you know, other gods aren't supposed to exist anyway, so why would he care? Not even going to go down that road. Point here is that he's persnickety about which direction people face when they perform certain tasks. Also, it says... Those 25 men were apostates. They ignored Jehovah and they violated the command recorded at Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 19. How they offended God who rightly deserves exclusive devotion. This kills me. I think I've mentioned this before in my, on my main channel, but the word apostate, it's from Middle English, from Ecclesiastical Latin apostata, from Greek apostates. It means runaway slave. So every time they call me an apostate, which I am, they're calling me a runaway slave. They're saying that they had me enslaved, they had my mind enslaved, and I broke free of those chains. So every time they call us apostates, they're revealing their true colors as far as I'm concerned. I will wear that as, as a badge of honor. I will take it. I mean, being called an apostate is actually somewhat to my detriment in the end because it means people are, are fellow uh, uh, slaves are afraid to listen to what I have to say as a result of that. They sling it around as, it's, as though it's an insult. Um, I take it as a badge of honor. Sling it as much as you want, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, here's paragraph 17. What can we learn from the account of those sun worshipers? To keep our worship tr uh, pure... We must look to Jehovah for spiritual enlightenment. Remember, Jehovah God is a sun, and his word is a light for our path. Okay, that was a quote from Psalms, by the way. Through his word and Bible-based publications from his organization, he illuminates our hearts and minds, showing us how to follow a course that leads to a satisfying life now and to everlasting life in the future. Okay, so what they're saying is, they're, they're kind of sticking with the metaphor here. They're saying that he, he, as the sun and as a light for our past, he illuminates our hearts and minds, right? Illuminates our hearts and minds, quote unquote. Okay, it says, um, if we were to look instead to this world for enlightenment on how to live, we would be turning our backs on Jehovah. Such a course would, be, would deeply offend him, causing him much pain of heart. We would never want to do that to our God. Ezekiel's vision is also a warning for us to avoid those who turn their backs on the truth, namely apostates. 
And as I've said, I am an apostate. So according to Jehovah's Witnesses, an apostate is basically anybody who has anything negative to say about the organization. That's what an apostate is, um, according to them. So it's not just somebody who speaks out against Jehovah. It's anybody who speaks out against the organization. They like to blur the lines between the two pretty uh, pretty well, uh, as much as they can. It's not just like your typical disfellowshipped person. They, they aren't really considered apostates. Just somebody who's... Or, or somebody who's kind of faded away, not really coming to meetings anymore, not really friendly with anybody in the congregation, that's not an apostate necessarily. It has to be somebody who's talking bad about the organization specifically. So it says, um, If we were to look instead to this world for enlightenment on how to live, we would be turning our backs on Jehovah. So here's a good example. With gay marriage, that is, in their opinion, quote unquote, uh, looking to the world for enlightenment on how to live. My issue with the whole thing is, with Jehovah's Witnesses' viewpoint on the whole thing is, I don't care if they don't if they don't want to get gay married. I'm not trying to force that on them. They are trying to force other people not to get gay married. That's the issue. Like, if you don't want to get married to a gay person, then don't. You don't have you don't have to have any say in it from that point on. It's like none of your business now. If you don't want to get gay married, just step out of the conversation completely. My right to swing my fist ends at the tip of your nose. I can swing my fist as much as I want up until it touches your nose. I can do whatever I want until it infringes on your rights. That's the key here. I can do whatever I want until it infringes on your rights. And what they're doing here is saying not just that they don't want to get gay married. That's fine. I mean, if they don't want to, they can swing their fist around as much as they want. They don't have to get married to a gay person if they don't want. But... That ends it at me. If I want to get gay married, they have no say in that anymore as far as I'm concerned. That is the libertarian philosophy. As I would consider myself left-wing, I, I also have a libertarian streak. I think I believe that people should not infringe on other people's rights as much as possible. We have to live in this society together. And that means we have to cooperate with each other, and you don't have the right to tell me what to do, as long as it's not affecting you. Gay marriage does not affect you in any way. Me getting married to a dude doesn't affect you in any way. Of course, I'm straight, but I want that right. I want everybody to have that right. So they're saying that we shouldn't look to the world for enlightenment on how to live. Gay marriage is just one one small example of how Jehovah's Witnesses twist things around to be all about them. It isn't about how other people want to live. It isn't about just leaving them alone, letting them live their lives, and not getting involved in it. It's about their wants and needs and how they want the world to be. Okay, so that was paragraph 17. This is, uh, this is, so this is 18. As we've seen thus far, Ezekiel witnessed four shocking scenes of idolatry and false worship that revealed the depth of apostate Judah's spiritual defilement. By becoming spiritually unclean, those Israelites damaged the relationship between the nation and God. But spiritual uncleanness and moral defilement go hand in hand. Not surprisingly, then, the apostate Israelites committed all manner of moral wrongs that undermined not just their relationship with God, but also their relationship with fellow humans. Let us now see how the prophet Ezekiel, under inspiration, described the moral decay of apostate Judah. Really fascinating how Jehovah's Witnesses view this whole situation. It says, By becoming spiritually unclean, those Israelites damaged the relationship between the nation and God. The thing is, they are basing their moral compass, their moral values off of the 
culture of four, five, six thousand years ago. And that's fine, I guess. Stupid as shit as far as I'm concerned, but I'm not going to infringe on your rights and tell you that's a stupid way to do it or that they they were nowhere near as advanced as we are today and, and didn't have the understanding of this kind of stuff like we do today. But I, I just have to draw the line when you try to infringe on my rights. I'm sorry, I can't let you do that. That is unacceptable. You can't tell me who I am allowed to marry. That's just unacceptable to me. Okay, so this is, um, the next subheading is called Moral Uncleanness, Obscene Conduct in Your Midst. Okay, um, paragraph 9 says, read Ezekiel 22, 3 through 12. That's actually pretty long, so I'm going to skip it. But uh, this is how it starts out. The nation was morally corrupt from the rulers on down. The chieftains, or leaders, used their authority to shed innocent blood. The people in general evidently followed their leaders in disregarding God's law. Now, like I said, God's law, the law to which they're referring, is thousands of years old and has no basis in reality, no basis in fact. It, there's, I mean, it's complete garbage. If they got something right in God's law, it's by pure coincidence. So I don't accept that we should be following that. I think that we should have informed ethics and morals, informed by science. Okay, it says, Within the family, children treated parents with contempt, and incest was commonplace. Okay, those are two things that I think we can all agree aren't fantastic. Incest is bad for the gene pool. Uh, treating anybody with contempt, as far as I'm concerned, is bad, especially uh, people that have authority over you is, is a bad thing. Within the land, the rebellious Israelites defrauded the foreign resident and mistreated the fatherless child and the widow. Israelite men violated their neighbors' wives. Wow, holy, I bet they didn't take that too well. Israelite men violated their neighbors' wives. How did they even get away with that? The people gave away, uh, I'm sorry, the people gave way to unrestrained greed by practicing bribery, extortion, and usury. Usury. Um, the illegal action or practice of lending money at unreasonably high rates of interest. Okay, there you go. That's what it means. Okay, so I have an issue with those three things. Bribery, extortion, usury. Those things, in my eyes, in most cases, are immoral. Or at least unethical. But greed is not a bad thing. It is the basis of our society. Our society would not operate without greed. But when you think about it, Jehovah's Witnesses, their whole goal in society, in life, is... I mean, if they had complete control over everything and everybody on the planet were Jehovah's Witness, they would get rid of police first and foremost. They'd get rid of police. They'd get rid of all governments. This is if everybody on the planet converted to Jehovah's Witness instantly. They'd get rid of police and governments and everything else. They'd set up congregations and everything would operate on a local level. So elders would for all intents and purposes, be the investigators, quote-unquote, the police, who investigated crimes or sins, actually, more accurately, not crimes, but sins, who investigated sins, and if they found somebody guilty of committing a sin, what they would do is they would disfellowship this person, and from that moment on, that person wouldn't be able to buy food at the store they wouldn't be able to fill their gas tank up because nobody would talk to them. Nobody would sell to them because they're all Jehovah's Witness. And the, the goal is that this person just wander off into the woods and die. That would be the ultimate goal. That's the purpose of the disfellowshipping arrangement is for these people to not be able to function anymore. That's what they want. They want them to, they want Jehovah's Witnesses to only function within the organization 
and once they leave, they feel so completely separated from everything that they can't function anymore, and they have to come back. They say that openly. They say, you, if you talk to them, then you're hurting their chances of coming back. We want to deprive them of that contact so that they feel that loss, so that they feel what they're losing. They say that in the literature. I mean, if that was my goal behind it, I would hide that shit. I wouldn't say that. It's an embarrassment. So, anyway. Greed is not a bad thing. Um, it's the whole basis for our, our economic system. And I've come to realize that. It's okay to want things. It's okay to want money and to want to do better it's okay to want to go to college, to want to send Kylie to college, to want to get her into a good college. That stuff is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It took me years to figure that out. So uh, continuing on, it says, The people gave way to unrestrained greed by practicing bribery, extortion, and usury. How it must have uh, pained Jehovah to see his covenant people trampling on his law and ignoring the loving spirit behind it. Jehovah took their moral bankruptcy personally. He directed Ezekiel to tell the immoral people, you have entirely forgotten me. Okay, so that was paragraph 19. Here's paragraph 20. Why do Ezekiel's words about the moral uncleanness of Judah have meaning for our day? The corruption in apostate Judah reminds us of the morally bankrupt world we live in today. Political rulers have abused their power and oppressed the common people. Religious leaders, in particular the clergy of Christendom, have blessed the wars of the nations that have, uh, that have caused the loss of countless millions of lives. Okay, I have to give them that. That is quite true. You, you know, you've got churches praying for us to win the war in Iraq or Afghanistan or something. That's kind of a crazy idea to think of. Uh, okay, let's continue on. It says, The clergy have watered down the Bible's pure and clear standards regarding sexual immorality. As a result, the moral standards of the world around us keep sinking even lower. Surely Jehovah would say to Christendom that he, uh, what he said to apostate Judah. You have entirely forgotten me. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I think that for I think that um, non-Jehovah's Witness Christian churches or non-Jehovah's Witness religions in general are crooked too. I think that Jehovah's Witnesses put a unique spin on being crooked, but I think the others are pretty messed up. And you can see it right here. I mean, this is them demonizing other religions. This is right here. This is the reason why I defaulted to atheist when I left Jehovah's Witnesses. Because they just demonized other religions. I mean, they'd call them out by name. They would say, you know, Baptists and Methodists and Catholics. Look at these odd beliefs that Catholics have. And they describe some thing that they do like praying to Mother Mary or something, you know. And I'd be like, yeah, that's so strange, isn't it? How weird. And as soon as I left Jehovah's Witnesses, I was like, well, I don't believe any of these. I mean, I don't believe in Catholicism. That's obvious BS. I don't believe in Mormonism. That's obvious BS. I don't believe in any of these. Because they conditioned me to, you know, think that they were fake. And honestly, I've taken an objective look at all of them uh, after leaving Jehovah's Witnesses, and they are all fake, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned. But that's why I defaulted to atheist, was because of the, these types of things that you see right here, you know. They, they do this all the time. The clergy have watered down the Bible's pure and clear standards regarding sexual morality. As a result, the moral standards of the world around us keep sinking even lower or ever lower, uh, so on and so forth. You know, talking about the clergy of Christendom have blessed the wars of the nations that have caused the loss of countless millions of lives. Anyway, that's why generally I, I have found that when Jehovah's Witnesses leave the religion, they usually 
turn out to be atheist. You don't usually find religious ex Jehovah's Witnesses. You do. It's I think it's just less common than finding religious ex anything else. Anyway. Okay, we got two more paragraphs here. Let's just knock them both out. So this is paragraph 21. What can we uh, what can we as Jehovah's people learn from the moral uncleanness of ancient Judah? To worship Jehovah acceptably, we must keep our conduct clean in all respects. That is no small challenge in this morally corrupt world. However, we know how Jehovah feels about moral corruption in all its ugly forms. We obey Jehovah's moral standards because we love him and his laws. To become morally unclean would be unloving toward our holy and clean God. We would never want to give Jehovah just cause to say to us, You have entirely forgotten me. You remember, because up there uh, a couple paragraphs ago, Ezekiel said that. To the others, Jehovah took their moral bankruptcy personally. He directed Ezekiel to tell the immoral people, you've entirely forgotten me. A throwback. Okay, this is uh, paragraph 22. We have learned some valuable lessons from reviewing Jehovah's expose. Ooh, nice word. I feel like that's an underused word. Jehovah's expose of the spiritual and moral decline of an, uh, I'm sorry, of ancient Judah. Surely we are strengthened in our resolve to give Jehovah the exclusive devotion that he so richly deserves. It just gets creepier and creepier that he so richly deserves. To that end, we must guard against all forms of idolatry and keep morally clean. Here's an example of idolatry. Having a cross necklace or having a cross, drawing a cross, anything at all to do with crosses. Crosses are, are idols as far as they're concerned. Wait, uh, what, though, did Jehovah do about his unfaithful people? At the conclusion of Ezekiel's temple tour, Jehovah plainly told his prophet, I will act in rage. We want to know what, we want to know what action Jehovah took toward unfaithful Judah, for a similar judgment will be executed on this wicked world. The next chapter will discuss how Jehovah's judgments against Judah were fulfilled. Fascinating. Okay, that's the very end of this chapter. I, okay, so here they're setting up a prophecy. They are drawing parallels between the book of Ezekiel and today. Um, It's the whole type, anti-type thing that they were talking about in the very beginning of the book. So what we're going to see in the next paragraph, I'm sorry, in the next uh, chapter, got to keep mixing those things up. What we're going to see in the next chapter is them basically telling us what's going to happen in the end times and showing us why it's already happening. I mean, I haven't read ahead yet. I'd be willing to bet that's what it's going to be about. So it's going to be really interesting to read through it, and I, I can't wait. I might actually do this one sooner. Um, every time I do the podcast, I release it the moment I finish it, like the very night that it's that I stop recording, I upload it to SoundCloud and iTunes and Google Play and Spotify and all that other stuff, CastBox and stuff. So if you guys want to listen to it early, you can listen to it in one of those locations. It releases every Thursday at 9 p.m. on YouTube if you want to watch it on YouTube instead. Uh, it's a little bit late this week, but it's fine. I'll make up for it uh, by doing another a little bit earlier than usual. But anyways, um, yeah, just check the podcast out if you want to take a look at it. Uh, SoundCloud and all that stuff. Links will be in the description. So, All right, guys, thanks for listening.